Hello, everyone, and welcome back to the Leveled Up Podcast. I'm Nick. And I'm Ash. And we are back in it. How, how's it going, Ash? <laughs> it's going pretty well. Yeah, something funny. I'm just hilarious. You yeah. are. That is true. Yeah. Um, so, uh, not, not pertaining to the podcast this week, but, um, we've been, we've been playing some games in our free time. Yeah. Uh, we've been, we've been listening to some of the gaming news, uh, that's coming out. Not. Well, by proxy, I hope. Sure. Um, but the, the new, uh, Hyrule Warriors Age of Calamity is coming out soon. Oh no, I thought we were talking about the new, we're not talking about the new character in Smash. Oh. <laughs> sure. Yeah, we can go that route. Uh, Steve was just announced uh, for Minecraft. For Minecraft, yeah. He was, <laughs> Steve is from Minecraft. He was just announced for Smash Bros. Um, I thought that was a pretty big shock. What, how'd you feel? Indifferent. Okay. I mean, it's been a meme for years, right? See, yeah, it's up there with Goku and Master Chief. I always Chief thought and... you wanted it to happen. No, I didn't. <clears throat> I, I, I don't know. Well, we watched the whole 45-minute gameplay we did, we did. from our man's uh, Sakurai. love of my life, He's honestly. A great guy. Sorry, Nick. Um, it's pretty cool. It is they pretty cool. They put a lot of thought and effort into actually putting him in. Like, it wasn't just a meme for them to put it in. No, like, it was. I, they had to do so much to get it to go in. Very clear. Sakurai was like, what have I created? Like, yeah, at the end of basically. that, he was like, I don't know what, what we did, guys, yeah. but it's in now. So... I just, I thought that was ridiculous. Yeah. Just as a what's going on in gaming right now. There so there was that announcement. Um, Hyrule Warriors: Age of Calamity is coming out soon, which is a prequel to Breath of the Wild, which you are still playing through even after our our episode a couple yeah, weeks I'm ago. Yeah, really I'm excited about it. How's how's that going? Good. I just defeated my first divine beast. Which one? Um, the elephant yep. Ruta. Yeah, Varuta. Yes. Yeah, you got it. Um, and that's been good. Just as an update. Yeah. Yeah. Um. Yep, that's all my gaming news. Okay, so speaking of games <laughs> uh, we're playing, Ash, what game did we play this week? The most irritating game known to man, Ooh, and the game known to give claim. me an aneurysm one day. Yep, okay. Yep. <clears throat> Which is? We're talking about Cuphead today. We are talking about Cuphead. Uh, Cuphead is a great game. Um, so this week, uh, it is a game that Ash is definitely newer to, uh, and yes. she started to pick up for this podcast. Um, but we actually played together. So for a lot of the recording, uh, I think for all of the recording, yeah, is actually you and I. Yeah, I refuse to play alone. Yeah, I couldn't get Ash to play this by herself because she was rage quitting too much. So I I played with her, but, um, even I, I had never beat this game, uh, either. I played a couple years ago with Mitch once again. Hi, Mitch. Um, hi, Mitch. Uh, he's listening. I know he is. Um, (laughs) and we, we got pretty far, but we never actually beat it. Uh, and I knew all the hype when it had come out. Um, and And now we're going to beat it because I'm a better friend than Mitch. All right. That's not what this, I'll cut (laughs) that. All right. So Cuphead is a classic run and gun action game that is heavily focused on boss battles. True. I sadly, truly know from the bottom of my heart. Um, very clear. It takes its inspiration from the 1930s, that Mm -hmm. being in its animation Mm -hmm. and in its musical composition. True. Very true. Uh, Nick, I thought you could talk about the actual plot line of it. Yeah. So for those that are unfamiliar, uh, Cuphead's kind of claim to fame is the fact that it is all hand animated. Mm -hmm. And like Ash said, it looks like a really old cartoon from the 1930s. Um, I know I'm reiterating, it's just that's kind of why people know Cuphead is, yeah. is its art style and the fact that it was hand animated, which is really, really, you're basically playing through a, an old cartoon, right? Um, so the story, uh, you play as Cuphead and or Mugman, who are two uh, brothers um, that their heads are shaped like a cup and a mug. Uh, and basically they are playing in a casino, in the Devil's Casino, and they uh, they get into some debt. And the devil is like, all right, one more, one more roll. And if you if you win this roll, I'll give you all the money in the casino. But if you lose this roll, then uh, I basically take your souls. So yeah, the norm. Classically, you know, Cuphead is like, oh, we got this. And Mugman is like, no, 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 don't do that. Don't do that. So they roll the dice. And of course they lose because it's the, it's the devil. I mean, you literally do not take a deal with the devil. That's kind of the whole, the whole point, yeah. right? So the devil goes to take their souls. And Cuphead is like, wait, 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 wait. Okay, hold on. <laughs> Why don't we help you out? Because I'm sure there's some other souls that you've been trying to collect, you know? The devil's like, yeah, okay, I could hire you guys as my muscle. So the main point of the game is uh, Cuphead and Mugman running through um, what the game calls the debtors, or the other people in debt to the devil, 
uh, which are these weird anthropomorphic plants, vegetables, animals, people, all sorts of yeah. crazy stuff uh, that serve as the game's bosses. So you guys run through trying to collect their debts to bring back to the devil so that he may release your souls from his grasp. Spoiler alert, though, it is the devil, so you know that's not going to happen. Hey, we didn't get to that point yet. That's the devil. You know, it's it's a tale as old as time. But want to hear a fun fact? Sure. Want to know why they decided to go with the devil? Or, like, not maybe not the whole reason, but a gist of it. Yeah. So, one of the main things they really wanted to do in the beginning of their development, uh, they wanted to stray away from the Mario-esque games the i want we have to save the princess get her back to the castle which is why they went straight we're working for the devil okay you couldn't get more opposite than saving a princess from a castle you know devil's where it's at what about capturing a princess and putting her in a castle Just, you know, princess <laughs> all right fair enough okay <laughs> um so a uh, cup <clears throat> head was released in September 2017. Yes, a long time ago now. Um, or why are we playing old games on this I podcast? Know. But um, after at least seven years of development. Yikes. Um, so that was um, a lot of years. And they even said that, so um, the developers, which I'll get into in a little bit later, they had the idea starting in 2000. So I mean, 17 years of 2000. Turning in the oh, brains. Oh, wow. I that is. They that's took. A long um, time. So, like I said, it was seven years of development, which means they started in 2010. And they actually started developing, like, taking the charge in developing yep. the game because of the. Uh, of Super Meat Boy. How. Um, really? Much uh, excitement and. Yeah, that was an early title that gained a lot of traction yeah. for being a brutal platformer, is, yeah. is what it was. Um, so, once they saw that they were doing being so successful, they really took charge and started it um but it was actually introduced to the public at e3 in 2014 Whoa. at um xbox's live media That's briefing right. uh, but it was solely um like a reveal trailer yep because it was completely like, unplayable in its form at the time and then it was at e3 every year after that until they actually released it right mm -hmm. um, so when did you hear about the game about Cuphead? Yeah. Um, oh, I, I mean, a couple months before it released in 2017, I guess. Um, the hype and the trailers that were surrounding it. I mean, you know I love indie games, yeah. and here was a whole bunch of news about a game that was fully drawn by hand, uh, hand animated, um, and was going to be this Boss Rush style game, which I absolutely love. Yeah. I love Boss Rush style games. Um, a couple others like that, uh, Jotun, or Jotun um, I don't know if you know that one. No. It's a Viking kind of top-down <gasps> version of this. Um, that's a good one. There's also Titan Souls. That is a fantastic one. Uh, or, I mean, probably the best known one is Shadow of the Colossus, which was a PlayStation exclusive mm -hmm. where you actually had to run around and just take down colossal titans. Uh, and that was the whole point of the game. Um, so games where you just have to hunt bosses, like, for the main gameplay. Very, very fun. So I was very excited, uh, when I knew this was going to be a thing. And the animation style was so cool, because it was so different, right? Yeah. It was so refreshing to see something weirdly you know 80 plus years old at uh -huh. the time so um did you play it right when it was released no i don't think so actually i think i waited a little bit i didn't get it right away i watched some videos of people playing it on youtube um and then i don't think it was until early 2018 uh that mitch and i actually played it yeah why do you think it gained so much popularity like just from the trailers that are released, you know. It's well, it's definitely the art. I I think it's so different, um, and it really harkens back to an era that people are aware of, right? Especially with the very early Mickey Mouse cartoons. That, that's where they took all their inspiration. Totally. I mean, the fact that even now in modern Disney movies, in, in some shorts or like before the Disney movies, you have bone. the Steamboat Willie. Um, so I mean, most people are familiar with the they're like Pac-Man eyes, yeah. you know, the little the black uh -huh. eyes that look like Pac-Man. Um, so for a game to say, hey, this art style shouldn't be dead, let's bring it back, um, that was incredible. And then the fact that the tagline under all the trailers was, yeah, we drew all these frames by hand, you're welcome. Like, that was, I think that's why people were like, oh my god, you know, we can go back to the old ways of doing things and make an awesome game. Yeah, that's really cool. Yeah. Uh, so let's dive into the dev team. So, yeah, yeah. Um... It started off with two Canadian brothers, actually. Yes. Chad and Jared Moldenhauer. Yeah, that's right. Um, who were the art director and lead game designer of the game. Mm -hmm. um, they, you know, through 
working through it, they ended up uh, creating a studio called Studio MDHR, mm -hmm. which, spoiler alert, it's their last name. Is it? Yep. Oh, okay. Um, yes. Which, um, <laughs> the coolest part about that is that their studio, I know at their largest, they were of 30 people. I'm not too sure if they still are, but they have five family members from the Moldenhauer crew on their team. Yeah, this is crazy. I, I know, the, the fact that they're just like, hey, yeah, we have an idea, you know, oh, let's get our sister in on this, Aunt Sally, she can join us, you know, Uncle Ted, you know, just get a whole bunch of the family Jackson members. It's the Jackson 5. <laughs> the Moldenhauer 5. All right. Um, and it was really surrounded by passion. Um, I'm going to talk about the development process in a little bit, but uh, it, clear as day in all the interviews you listen to or watch, it's just that they loved their idea of this game. They wanted to see it be beautiful. It was a passion project. Yeah, which, you know, you see often, I guess, but nothing this small. I don't know. It's it's really heartwarming to hear these, like, small indie games come to life after, you know. Well, yeah, and I mean, the fact that, you know, they quit their jobs, right? Yeah. In, in 2015, they were in the marketing and construction industries, remortgaged their houses, and threw everything they had left at developing their first video game, like you said, because they had the idea since 2000. Yeah, and I will say that they um, caution that very, very greatly. Uh, <laughs> and a lot of their interviews, they say, yeah, of course, they did do all this, and sure, if you feel passionate about it, do it, but take it one step at a time. Yeah. They, uh, I just loved it. The more I read about them, the more I actually just wanted to work there. Um, they really did take their company one day at a time, and when they saw something wasn't working, they changed it. You know, they moved people around to the right roles. Like, they were talking about, of course, I can't remember which one. I think it was Jared. Jared was really bad with uh, timelines and okay. making sure things got done. So, uh, maybe the sister, maybe the cousin, maybe the wife. I don't know which one <laughs> it was. One of the Molten Towers, <laughs> sure. who was um, uh, on the team to be an artist, she just took reins. She was like, no. She like, become a producer? Yeah. Oh my god. And an artist, but she was like, no, like we can't do this. Wait, wait, wait. Sorry. Hold the phone. Yes. A producing artist. Boom. See, kids, it can be done. Yes. I just, that multi, that multi job is out there, <laughs> right? There you go. Um, but she was like, no, like, this can't be happening. Like, we cannot succeed with this being like this. Mentality. And so she picked up everything she knew, dropped it out the window, and started to become a producer for the company. This you is know? wild, yeah. Um, they hired new people, adopted new methodologies, just to make sure everything came to what they needed it to be. Um, which is, you know, awesome. And obviously this is their first produced game, and only produced game at the current moment. Um, which, you know, it's a great game. It's a be great your, game. You're one and only at the moment. <laughs> yeah, no kidding. And it's still, it's got a lot of traction. There were a couple updates to it. Well, yeah, they just released, like, uh, super recently on the PS4. Um, yeah, that's So true. they are currently on the Switch, PC, Xbox One, and PS4. Mm -hmm. Probably soon to come to the PS5, but we'll have to ask Mitch about it. That's right, that's right. Um, <clears throat> and like you touched on, they originally only wanted it to be, consist of boss battles. Yes. Uh, what they were actual, the, the actual plan, which is super cool, is that they wanted to surpass the Guinness World Record for number of boss battles in a game. I didn't know that. Um, is that which was, really? Um, 25 at the time, what and game? I think, I don't know. That's why I thought. 25 boss battles. But um, I think they got to maybe 19 Yeah. at the end of it. I'm not yeah. too sure with all the updates and the DLC. I don't know if they count that. Um, oh my, that's crazy. But that was like their, like, driving factor was like they wanted to win the Guinness World Record. Um, and like you said, after the surge of attraction, they quit their jobs, um, maxed out any loan they could take out, and then um, they got in bed with Microsoft. Oh, whoa, uh, they what? Sure, I said it. Okay. To make sure like, Cuphead could be better than they had Mr. been Gates. Of. Okay. So that's basically when the shift went away from being um, a primarily boss battles. So when they started working with Microsoft, they were like, hey, we need to add more content into the game. So now they are 75% boss battles and 25% platforming levels. True, um, yep. Very, very strongly on those ratios. Okay. Um, how did you feel about the ratio of boss battles v 
platforming? I feel like this should be a you question. Uh, maybe we should both answer this. Okay. Um, when I first picked up the game, I was actually hoping it would be more of a run and gun, which is the genre that it falls under. Which is? Um, I, it's a game where you literally run and gun. It's kind of like a platformer, but you move from left to right. There's a lot of things happening at once, and you generally have some kind of blaster or gun that you just fry enemies through the levels. Favorite part? They're finger guns in this game. Finger guns. Pew pew. Yeah, they really are. <laughs> um, so when I first got the game, I was hoping that it would kind of go like level, level, boss, level, level, boss. Okay. You know, like you had to work your way up to yeah, a boss yeah. per world. Um, so you could get a hang of the mechanics and stuff, but you were right, you know, we jumped in, oh, and the first thing you do is fight a boss, and yeah. you're like, oh, you know, okay, and there's actually 75, 25%, you already yeah. said it. Um, so there's actually very few platforming levels. Um, but my god, if the levels aren't harder than the bosses themselves, those platforming yeah. levels are, well, what did you think of them? I actually, I almost want to say that I preferred the platforming levels. Okay. Um, because... But you're not, you are not someone that plays either of these genres of no, platformers no, 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 no. or running guns or boss battlers. I can't even think of... Bosses make me anxious. I know. Oh. We've seen your Gungeon gameplay. Uh, yeah. Um, <laughs> um, and I honestly never thought of um, the... Cuphead bosses as bosses. Um, I, I thought of them as levels. You know what I mean? Like, I didn't think of them as these, like, mega... I guess, yeah, because they're divided into so many phases. Yeah, uh, which is so strange. I, I was gonna say I prefer the platformers because I hate phases. Not that I hate. I mean, they're really cool. I hate for my um, temper and my game <laughs> play ability. Well, I hate them. What won't be caught on the footage is every time Ash got up uh, and had to leave the room or we had to stop playing Cuphead for a while. Yeah. It's rough. And I know if you look it up, they always say that it's like painful yet playable. And I just think it's a load of BS. Right. Okay. They, like a lot of the times it gets hinted like, why is it so hard? And they're like, ah, it's not that hard. And I'm like, <laughs> okay, that's fine. Um, which one do you prefer? Which what do I Bosses prefer? Bosses or platformer? Do I prefer? In this game. Um, I like the bosses a lot more. Uh, I think, I, I've talked about this before, I think on the podcast, but I'm someone who really likes mastery in video games. Yes. Um, so being able to do something again and again until you find, like, the best way, or your best way of doing it, it doesn't have to be the best programmed way, but, like, you come up with a strategy that works for you, the best strategy. Yeah. Um, so I really like the boss battles because they have such defined phases with their over-the-top animations, you can clearly tell, like, okay... Once I figure out this phase, I've got it. I'll probably die to the second phase, but then I keep playing until I figure out that phase and then, you know, get further and further. Whereas the platformer levels is, as you're running to the right, there's just more stuff that is falling <laughs> yeah. onto the... There's no strategy there, you know? It's just... No strategy. Oh, I wouldn't... <laughs> it's too much. All right, maybe this is going to be the last episode of our podcast. Is that it? <laughs> it might be. Why is that? Because we're not seeing eye to eye. So, talking about mastery of levels... Let's talk about speedrunners. Oh, yes. Okay. What Today, about speedrunners? Today, we watched a really great video from IGN. We did. Yeah, um, that was... It was developers react to speedrunners. So it was actually uh, Jared and Chad yep. uh, reacting to not the fastest play, like uh, the um, record. Yep. Not but the I think this, this guy is known for doing the speedrunner and he was trying to beat the world record. I don't know if he actually did because Mike wouldn't let me finish it. Right. Well, um, it went into spoiler territory. Yeah. He wanted to avoid that. Uh, are you a speedrunner? No. Um, I like speedrunning. I've never actually attempted to speedrun a game. Um, I love watching it. It is so uh, f fun to watch, I think. Especially really old games mm -hmm. where you can just completely mess with the game mechanics. Yeah. Um, like Super Mario 64. There was a really, really awesome video of how few stars you actually needed to get to the end and beat the game. And at first everyone thought it was like the minimum 13 you had to get. And then people found out you could do it in three. And then people found out you could do it in one. You know, and people kept trying to get lower and lower yeah. for the actual stars to how they would glitch to the end of the game. Um, I've never done it. Uh, I, I don't think it would take too much time in a single game, I think. Because mm -hmm. you'd have to keep mm -hmm. playing the game over and over and over and over again. Um, but I love watching it. I, I think the people that do it are, are incredible. I know um, in that video, um, Chad and Jared talked a lot about in the development process trying to either 
you know, take away what these speedrunners have found or actually put in little secrets for yes, the speedrunners. Yes, yes. How do you feel about that in, in the development? I think that's awesome. I think something that we learn when we're studying game design is you always want to focus on the golden path or the optimal state of play. Mm -hmm. So when you're designing something, even as simple as a platforming level, uh, you want to put everything in a place where you think most players will go or the most average players will go to, right? Which is very, very cool. You can think of it like a golden thread weaving throughout the level. Like it goes up on this platform, then down into this tunnel, and then, you know, this is where most players will go. We're drawing their attention here. It's like the most average route. You know, that's, that's kind of how you're taught to design for wide audiences. What's really cool is once you've mastered that golden path, you can then start to put in extra tidbits when you know that people are going to take your game to another level. And it was really interesting listening to uh, Jared and Chad because they had said there were a couple of things they wanted to put in for speedrunners, but it didn't even matter because the speedrunners took yeah. like the mechanics that already existed to a whole other level. Mm -hmm. So I think that that type of design is really, really cool. Once you have that golden path to go back and say like, okay, we should also cater to our more competitive or more speedrunning players by adding in an extra parry here or an enemy that, that boosts your speed here. You know, like really almost secret things that to a normal player would just be like, oh, that might be a little extra difficult. But to a speedrunner sees it as, oh my god, I can use this to get the momentum I need to continue. Yeah. Um, I know I, I talked about it a little bit before and I, I mean, inspirational is all I can think of with uh, these two brothers and you know I guess the whole family <laughs> with this studio because you know, it, it's I am a sucker for passion projects as Nick knows um, how does hearing the story and like you know millions of stories like this impact your dreams and aspirations within the game industry it's it's so crazy you know because you see a lot of indie usually one or two man studios you know that come out like um concerned ape who made stardew valley right total passion project Minecraft. uh notch yep also a total passion <laughs> project um although you know it's a little bigger now yeah. um but right concerned ape his girlfriend was basically supporting him at the time and he was super super grateful and he had dropped everything to just focus on this game and he worked for years and years before he even put a trailer yeah. out you know he just kept working and working because he said it's not finished i don't want people to see it until it's in a playable state because i want it to be representative of my passion and of my strife mm -hmm. you know um i don't know how it affects my hopes and aspirations i think i mentioned this before but i always wanted to go indie when i first went into um studying game design was always a dream to be like, okay, I'm gonna learn the ropes and then I'm gonna I'm gonna either open a small indie studio or like work on my own games and publish them. But you hear a lot of these stories and while it's really inspiring to listen to, the number one thing they say is, my God, don't do it. You yeah. know, they're like, be so careful, have passion and work on your projects, but it is so risky. And we only ever hear about the ones that I succeed, know. you know? Yeah. There, I remember when we went to PAX two years ago, there were there was the team working on a full depart. Oh, um, I love the. It was so cute, and it actually was released. So yeah. thank, that was awesome. Two years later. Yes, but when we had talked to them, they basically said they were at the end of their funds. You know, they yeah. they were like, we're a small studio. We got all the funding we can. Like, this is our final push, and if we can't make it, then the game is dead in the water. And it was really sad, because even at the time at PAX, it was adorable. It was beautifully it, made. It was a little clunky, but it, it was fun to play. Yeah. Um, the story was really cute. Um, so thankfully, you know, later down the line, that game actually resurfaced. But I don't know, it's, it's kind of inspiring and also kind of heartbreaking to hear about these stories because there's a lot that you don't hear about where people are like yeah we really did try it we threw everything and we failed you know yeah. it's it's the game industry is very saturated these days so when gems like cuphead or stardew come along it's incredible to see i i i always still hope that that will be me once be me someday but you know who knows yeah um I thought, just like last time, we kind of dive a little deep into, oh, at least um, with the Guardians of Tsukuma, we dive deep into their music. Yes. Uh, obviously, another very important part in this game, but on top of their art. I found a couple fun facts that I thought you'd like. Yeah. Um, so as we talked about, it's 1930s inspiration. Totally. Uh, clearly. Big band music. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Um, so every single frame of animation in the entire game, like you said, was drawn and inked by an artist on paper. Yes. 
and they need 24 separate frames of art for one second of animation. It's the old-fashioned animation of 24 frames for yep. the actual animation. Which, totally. You know, crazy. Super um, crazy. And the only thing digital with the process is that the art is with the art is that they use digital coloring. Right, so they put it into like Photoshop and colored it digitally mm -hmm. after they drew it. Yes. Yes. So they did testing um, to make sure that that was the right move, and they ultimately decided that they couldn't even tell the difference between a hand colored <laughs> and a digital colored. Wow. Um, and they estimated that it saved them six years of development time. Whoa. Wouldn't that be harder? I mean... Uh, oh, I see. You mean to do the, the digital yeah, save Yeah, them. it had oh. saved them six years of film. Six, six years. Six years. Oh, wow. Isn't that crazy? That is crazy. And for them not to even know the difference. Thank God for technology. We love it. Um, I want you to guess how okay. many hand-drawn frames are in Cuphead. Oh, my God. Frames? Frames. Oh, boy. Okay. Um... I'm gonna guess upwards of sixty thousand. Did you read my notes? No, I didn't. I swear to God, Nick. I didn't read my notes. How many is it? Sixty thousand. It's you just 60? Put the phone out of everything. Oh my God! No, that was awesome. That was a complete guess. I don't believe you. Okay, <laughs> um, it's a little bit estimating in my head there, but. Oh come on. Sweet. All right, sixty thousand. No, say it with enthusiasm. I can cut my bit. Ready? How many? How many was it? How many do you think it was? Nick? Oh, like two frames of animation in Cuphead. Let me do you one better. Okay. 60,000. 60,000 frames. 60, frames. Yep. Oh, I would have never guessed that. You little shit. <laughs> uh, Still, I though. I thought that was crazy. That's incredibly And impressive. I know, I was uh, listening to, God, I can't remember her name, and I feel horrible, but the, the, the sister, cousin, sister lady cousin. I don't of think you can... Lady Moldenhauer. Um, her name starts with an M. I feel so bad. Oh, go back. Sorry, I'm looking at my notes. Uh, Mariah? Ma Mariah? Maria? Yeah. Uh, producer and artist, badass woman. Um, I was listening to one of her interviews and she said that the best thing in hindsight that they did was not think, they didn't even come up with a number while um, they were developing of how many like frames they needed, of how much X they so needed. So no goal? No goal. No Other than like they wanted to yeah do this thing they wanted to do this boss um because she was talking about it. she was like well, while, while i was actually doing the art like i don't know how i would have been able to finish it if i knew wow okay i just got 100 done right and here's 50 yeah. whatever thousand more she was like i i don't know how that would have impacted my morale that's true all. yeah it's it's always when you don't know where the finish line is it's always closer than you think yeah um and did you know what their original concept for art was? The original concept? Oh, I don't think I do. Uh, so it was actually, they wanted it to be a game based around children's art styles. Okay. Yeah. And they ended up with, you know, the art style that they have, which is strongly based around the Disney um, Disney cartoons. And then, um, who's the artist? That it's Max Fleischer? Fleischer. I think, yeah. He's very famous for those. Mm -hmm. And then they got the um, inspiration for Mugman, Mugman, Mugman. And, <laughs> and Cuphead from um, a Japanese artist. Actually, it was um, it, it there was a an art uh, man, I guess. An like, artist? Well, like no, no, no. I mean, like like Cuphead, like uh, oh, a, a character. A char Thank you. Okay. Art man. An art evil man. Character. Or a um, woman. Called it was basically translation evil Mickey. Um, what? That was in whatever year he was the Japanese artist created this evil Mickey, and they took a Cuphead from that. They like redid it, obviously copyright, but really, yeah, was was that like a, a recent or like you mean in the 30s and 40s there was an artist that made evil Mickey? Uh, I wish I knew that answer for you. Because they made Epic Mickey, uh, which was a game that came out I don't know like 10 years ago, which had a lot of like original artwork uh with oswald and stuff like that i don't know if that's no i don't think so okay uh, well that's really cool yeah either way that that's kind of they twisted that into what we now see as cuphead and uh, mugman uh, and then eventually lady chalice right 
Yeah, that's a DLC. Yeah, right? it is. But I don't think it's on the Switch because I didn't see it in the store. Yeah, I don't know. I saw it because it's like, it's a thing about dessert. It's something sweet. Just dessert, yeah. I don't know. Something like that. Um. Yeah, art. Pretty cool. Pretty cool. I, I, uh, I talked about how picky and... You did, you did. Uptight on art I am. I like it. I like it a lot. I know. Um, it's really cool. Again, it's you are playing through a cartoon. I don't know if it would be anything that I would pick out to play. Really? Yeah. Okay. Uh, to be honest, I think it would be cool. And I mean, we're being blunt here. I didn't want to play the game at all. No. <laughs> surprise, surprise to anyone listening. Um, it looked hard. And it breaks my soul. A little bit every time we play. Yeah, I know. Which I knew was gonna happen, but I mean, it's fun. It's fun to win. It's like a, it's like the reason why I like programming. It sucks until you win, and then it just feels really good. <sighs> you win programming. Yes. Uh, well, why don't we use that opportunity to actually talk about the gameplay? Yeah. Um, because this is not a game that you would have ever played. Correct me if I'm <laughs> wrong. No. Uh, not the genre, not the actual play style. So. When you're in the game itself, uh, in the platforming levels, it controls much like a very fast-paced platformer. Yes. Um, you move from left to right, you can jump, you can dash, and you can shoot your gun in the original joystick eight directions. Um, so, you know, up, down, left, right, yeah. and all the diagonals, uh, which is very cool. You can actually select from a multitude of guns, although they take uh, money to buy. Um, that They all shoot different projectiles, which are pretty cool. In-game money. Yes, okay, in-game money. Um, and then you can equip perks and specials and, like, augment your character slightly. Mm -hmm. uh, but mostly, it's just about uh, skill. Yeah. Besides that, like, the, the actual gameplay focuses a lot on player skill and not Gross. a lot about in the game. And then the actual boss levels uh, differ very slightly um, into what I call, or I've kind of broken them into three different categories. Okay. You have the stationary boss levels. These yep. are the levels like the root pack or the slime in the very beginning, mm -hmm. um, where you are in one area, you don't have to worry about anything moving around you, and you are fighting on the ground. Uh, then you have the moving levels, which mm -hmm. are like the dragon, when the, the clouds are kind of flying yeah. in from the right, you have to continuously the platform. The B, right? That's another moving level because you have to keep going up. And then the aerial levels, where yes. you're, you actually change controls completely and you fly around in a plane, uh, all of your guns are different, everything is different, I and you're those. fighting larger-than-life bosses. Yeah, those are pretty cool. Um, very interesting. Honestly, when we... Uh, Mitch and I played the first couple bosses the very first time we played, um, and it was all on the ground, and then you get the airplane blueprint, and I was like, what a weird yeah. transition to go from this, like, run-and-gun boss fighter to all of a sudden doing, like, an old arcade dogfight kind of game um, that turns more into a bullet hell than anything else, but... Um, so that's pretty much what the game is. You have to dodge projectile after projectile after projectile. Um, but I thought this might be a cool opportunity to let you in on a little uh, <laughs> game design secret that the developers worked Hit in here. Me with it. So, this game functions heavily off of not character ability, but player ability, right? How well do you grasp the controls? How quick is your uh, hand-eye coordination, your reaction timing? It's one of those games of high mastery. Yes. Um, so it, it really depends on how how quick you as a person can learn the game, um, rather than the game just giving you better and better abilities, mm -hmm. which, you know, some platformers and games do. Mm -hmm. So, knowing this, um, our, our good friends, uh, our brothers Chad and Jared, they threw in an element of game design that you see in a lot of games, but works especially well in very fast-paced games where players don't know what's happening a lot of the time. Do you know what that mechanic might be? Um, <coughs> uh, fun? I don't. Is there fun in this game? No. No. <laughs> Ash says no. Yeah, you got me. I'm stumped. It's color, actually. A lot of games uh, try to use color in such a way that teaches the players repetition. Oh, you. Right? you s yes. So there are actually a lot of games that will say red equals danger. So mm -hmm. you know in very old games, if you ever saw a red wall, uh, and this actually comes from a, a kind of a universal uh, theory about color and symbology in game design, because way back in the day when games could only support eight colors and 16 <laughs> colors, you know, on, on different bit uh, yeah. processors, um, they had to convey what the objects were in the arcade machines in a lot of different ways. So oftentimes your character was a very bright, I think Pac-Man yellow, right? Was yes. just bright yellow on the screen. 
the stage was a darker blue, and then all of the ghosts were these neon colors, you know, like neon red and stuff like that. Um, and even though Pac-Man, you could pretty easily tell what everything was, you know, it still used color to convey the different background, foreground, character, that kind of stuff. Cuphead does a similar thing, and many games do a similar thing with that. But in a game like Cuphead, there's a lot going on, so it's a saving grace when the player sees something pink floating from across the screen mm -hmm. uh, towards the left. Because they teach you one of the very first mechanics is if you jump and then press the jump button again while you are colliding with anything pink, you do what's called a parry. Mm -hmm. This negates all damage and actually charges your special meter a little bit. You can think of it like a block or a counter in other games like that. Um, some bullet hells or games like this, like we played Enter the Gungeon and talked about it, uh, they don't have anything like that. Any bullet, um, although they all act differently, you roll through, right? Yeah. That is that is what you do. You know, that's how you dodge bullets. In this game, there are select few projectiles that are pink, letting the player know, hey, for a little extra skill, I can try and parry that and fill my special meter, and it will also mean I dodge this bullet because I don't take any damage. In the first couple levels, that's very obvious, right? You can see when we were fighting the frogs, they actually shoot out a couple of like Hadouken fireballs <laughs> that are very obviously pink mm -hmm. and you know flying towards the player. Later on in the game, they actually hide it quite well. Um, yes. In some of the, uh, I think Beppy the Clown, actually the very front of the roller coaster mm -hmm. actually has a pink blinking nose, yeah. um, which is hard to spot at first until you realize that it's pink. So this is a very, very clever game design mechanic they use because, and I'm gonna ask you, in some of the later boss levels we played, how often do you actually know what's going on? Uh, maybe close to never. Okay, <laughs> close to never. <laughs> and that's that's not a stab at, at you or anything like that. No, it is, it's, there's so much going on in one frame. We were playing the Calamaria fight, um, the basically yes. the, the mermaid uh, siren, and some of the bullet hell stuff that goes on with her towards the end of the game oh is just, God. it's too much, to be completely honest, and right? I think the craziest part about it is that it's randomized yes so, like you yeah. know what's gonna happen you know the separate uh subsections like they were like bombs they were puffer fish they were uh ghost pirates there were two different kinds of fish that spewed things out but you never knew when or what order they were yeah. gonna come at you so speaking to that point uh -huh. the beautiful thing they did is they ingrained early on in the player's brain that pink equals yes. parry. Mm -hmm. So later in the game, even when things don't look like projectiles and you are running around the map just trying to remember the controls, trying to dodge <laughs> everything, when pink comes on screen, it's almost second nature at that point, and I mean, you can attest to this if you want, to almost double click that button when you see something pink mm -hmm. automatically. Yeah. Yeah, I think uh, once you get back into the game, it's really hard to stop playing. I know just recently we picked it back up and I, yeah. like I talked about, we have just been into a Breath of the Wild spree. Yes. And I think I spent an hour of us playing the game just screaming, jump, dash, shoot, jump, dash. Every time I would click a button because yes. I could not, like I just kept jumping or dashing in the wrong order because of what um, Breath of the Wild had me be doing. Uh, but there's one thing that I was still there was that pink you try to Parry. double yeah uh, double jump uh, I'm not very good at it I normally get hit by those projectiles uh, but I think it's really cool that it's the same um, mechanic mechanic Probably. I guess no 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 it's the same uh, button you press to revive your player too it is it's the same system yeah. so I was actually just gonna say it's not only like pink projectiles and things that come at you, but when uh, either player one or player two dies and the other person remains, uh, you can revive the other player because you see their soul kind of leave their body with a pink heart. So even if you didn't know like what button to press, you know that pink equals parry. Yeah. It was such a genius move on the game developers in such a hectic game to say, okay, ground zero, we're gonna ingrain that pink means parry. So, uh, the you know, the more you play, the more stuff comes at you the player it's almost like muscle memory it yeah. trains the brain to know as pink kind of flies on the screen you press that button a couple of times you parry the shot i just thought that that was really cool and in a game that is as hectic as this and we found out we've died 972 times uh from when we last played and then we're gonna have to check again we are gonna have to check again um so so helpful you know even in some of those more uh, some of the later fights when we were facing the boss for the first time and we just lucked out because it would, yeah. something pink would come on and we would just instantaneously press the parry mm -hmm. button. But that's my spiel on the, the clever mechanic that they threw in there.
We love a good game designer. Right. Yes. Can we talk about the music now? Yes, please. Let's talk Ooh, about the music. It's so cool. Um, so, the music, the head musical composer was percussionist Chris Madigan. Okay. And, fun fact, Chris is actually a childhood friend of the brothers while they were growing up. Really? So, keeping it in the family again. I like this little group that they've amassed. I, I, I think it's so cute. Like, I know you've always uh, dreamt about, you know, living with all of your friends. Yes. At the end of the day. And I've always wanted to live in a cul-de-sac with all my best friends. Right. Let me just go to work with all my best friends. I know. That would be ideal. And they all actually want to be there. They're not Oh, and family, though. I don't know accounts. if I can. I don't know if I can do that. It's funny because um, Mariah. Yep. Or she, Maria. I'm sorry. <laughs> um, she was talking about how fun, like, how strange it is to be like, yeah, Chad, you're fired. You know? Because, like. Yeah, it's you such can't. a different dynamic, you know? <laughs> um, I can't imagine. But he actually, Chris, he worked with a 13-piece big band, a 10-piece ragtime ensemble, oh, and yeah. more just to get the soundtrack completely perfect. Um, and they have a little over three hours of jazz ensemble music. Which is amazing. Yes. Um, we love to hear it. I know. Honestly, yes. Uh, and they have since released... You know, um, a vinyl record of the entire soundtrack. You can so get the soundtrack cool. anywhere. And you can actually get the sheet music. Yeah, for you told the me that. That I is really cool. Amazing. Like, I wish we would have done that for one of our marching band shows. Right? Imagine playing what the Cuphead. What show are you doing? Cuphead, you know, the norm. <laughs> um, how do you feel about the music? How did you. How do you. Oh, it was great. You, you know it was... I love big band jazz. I mean, yes. that era of music is probably my favorite era of music, right? Ooh. All of the ragtime stuff that came out of it, and you can hear it. And even though they add the old-timey filter afterwards, right, so it sounds like it's coming from an old jukebox or radio from way back in the day, you can... I mean, you can really tell, especially uh, the level when the frogs are kind of... You're brawling them. It's in a bayou swamp. Yes. And it's like that, that ragtime, almost jazzy music that you can hear, um, which is such a cool, you know background piece to yeah. that um all of the music i think fit the bosses great. i was gonna say i think just like we talked about in the gardens between where um very opposite to this game more relaxed emotional music or this fits the anxiety levels of the game yeah very fast paced yep. um in your face almost music oh it has to be um, yeah that in itself you know i think if I wasn't too stuck on trying to remember my controls. Uh, it would drive me crazy, you know? Totally. Uh, where it's like, I think if I heard the soundtrack by itself, I'd be nervous that my heart would just start beating because I've just, um, in my brain, I've just combined the two. Yep, I know. Um, I really liked it. And I think, um, so he was the head musical composer and the only composer uh, on the team. Yep. Beautiful job. Yeah, uh, he is an original, uh, originally a percussionist or drummer. Cool. So cool. I thought, you know, it's drummers. I'm a percussionist um, by trade. Uh, <laughs> uh, it's really interesting to hear that come out of him, you know, because like obviously drummers, like percussionists in general, like the beat. That's what. Yeah. At the core, but it's um, it was really he he did a wonderful job. He did. He did. And I really think if, if there's one thing that I, I want to be known for, for my personal repertoire of game design, is that my push of theme is always the most important yes. thing in any game. Games will fail without a solid theme. And that is like my mantra. I believe that the music plays into the theme so well because the whole game plays like a show tune, right? Yes. It's like an old cartoon or, or an old show that you're just going to watch, almost like theatrical, mm -hmm. right? All of the music in the background, like the stage props, the lighting, um, the different characters, the way they're drawn, even the story as it like cuts to a sides with the devil and the in the in the dice. Um, the theme is just so solid, and the music builds on that incredibly. You know, mm -hmm. of just of keeping the era, keeping everything just airtight. Nothing felt out of place. Yeah, I loved it. Yeah. Um, one more fun fact. Yeah, hit me. You know, they have sold over six million copies. Six of million Cuphead since Whoa. July of this year. Oh, good. Wait, what? Since July, so you know, probably more than that. Wow. Okay. And, uh, as of July. Yeah, as of July. Oh, I sorry, thought you sorry. meant from July till Oops, now. My Oof. Bad. I don't know English. <laughs> um, 
And they sold a million copies in their first two weeks. That's incredible. Yeah. They're good for them. I they know. deserve that. That is awesome. So my question for you, okay. um, as this is kind of asking Ashley, did you like the game? I know it's kind of a love-hate relationship. I would almost call it masochistic, but <laughs> did you like it? Yes. I think at the end of the day, yeah, I do like it. And it's a game that, while I do need to have the right headspace to play, uh, it is challenging, but not challenging enough to get me to never play again. Right. It's something that I find so much joy in beating um, and mastering that I don't mm -hmm. want. I'll let it go for a couple days, if not weeks, months, maybe. But wow. I always want wow. to go back. Um, yeah, I enjoy the entire, like you said, the theme, the whole big picture of the game. I, I really, really enjoyed it. I don't think it's for everyone. I no. will make that very clear right now. Is that so? If you had to it's give it's not for a beginner gamer. Okay, so if your sales pitch was like right now on the floor to all of our listeners, what audience would you say would play this game, and why uh, would they like it? I would say um, try a bullet hell first. Okay. Uh, like try dungeon, even you know blazing beaks, something that has a lot going on, a lot of little things, a lot of mechanics that you have to learn see how you like that first and then maybe play your friend's copy of cuphead don't go ahead and buy it <laughs> okay uh, so who do you think is gonna like this game psychopaths wow <laughs> <laughs> people who like to feel pain yep okay um no i mean like people who uh, truly find joy in like you said i think mastering something or okay. finding the um rhythm in a game trying oh, yeah. to the little ways to do things and of course i think the speed runners i'm sure from yeah. the videos i've seen i think this is a great game to find the little quirks and the secrets in it was interesting not to super double no, back but to go on that point uh once more the uh devs watching a speedrunner video that we saw mm -hmm. mentioned that the speedrunner in question was using version one of the game yes and in the original release at least on steam which you guys can go back and play if you go through the versions tab on steam or the betas or something like that you can switch back to the original version um there was a l so much was different yes. right all, some of the bosses here's an interesting tidbit i'm gonna link the video in the little i card so people can go watch that devs watch the speedrun video it's a really good one um but the devs admitted that they actually put the second and third phases of the bosses directly off screen, right? So yeah. when they switched phases, it wasn't actually the boss like leaving and coming back. The first phase would die, and then the new boss second hold. phase would come on screen. But sometimes they were just like waiting there off screen. So what the speedrunner did in the first version is they would fire a lot of bullets off screen because that would actually kill one of the phases, which was mind-blowing so cool. and the developers it. thought that was crazy they were like yeah. yeah it was kind of a not not good foresight on our part yeah. to just kind of leave <laughs> the bosses all around you know off screen so yeah, yeah. but uh all in all a good game yeah i'd say i think there's a lot going on it's very fast paced yes um yeah i mean i i think we we deconstructed that quite nicely yeah um well-designed game the team is great you know i think the biggest takeaway from that is we haven't talked too much about the people behind some of mm -hmm. these uh developer projects especially i mean breath of the wild is huge um but this studio just such a good studio right their their story their team their family and They're friends big old family uh what do you think is next for them do you think they're gonna i know they made dlc and updates and stuff do you think they're gonna try you and know, stray away thinking from about that. i don't know i think like it might be hard um, because, like you said, like the reason why this game originally got so much popularity was because of the art style. So it makes me wonder if, not necessarily that they have to, but if they need to make a game in the same art style over and over again. Um, or if, if they stray away from that, will they be successful? Um, I, I, I worry that, but I think, you know... Give me a prequel, a sequel. I don't know. Um, sure, okay. Keep playing on Cuphead, so you know? you think something in the Cuphead genre, then? I can't see why not. You know, something's doing well. People love it. And, I mean, honestly, it's a really short game. Yeah, it is. Um, um, I just wanted to bring this game up uh, real quick, because this actually has an almost yes. identical art uh -huh. style.
uh, called Bendy and the Ink Machine. Um, and I'm sure maybe a couple of our listeners will know this. It's not the most well-known game. Um, similar art style. However, the actual game itself is a first-person puzzle action horror game. Um, it kind of plays on that like marionette drawn mm, horror style, mm. almost Tim Burton esque, um, but it's it's like a, a puzzle horror game. Uh, I we don't need to delve too much into it yeah. as we're nearing the end of our podcast. Um, but that was a similar art style, and I know you were talking about like were they just trying to bank off that art style? So I don't know. Yeah, you know? I know. I, I I worry for them because well, I just. I don't know. Like it, it's it's hard. It's kind of like one of those one hit wonders in songs yep. where like you yeah. do so well in something, will it work if you try to do something else? Well, especially a lot of people try and break away from that, right? Like especially a lot of celebrities that are known for one role, right? They immediately they're like, guys, I can act in other things, right? I I can be the I'm not just this character. Five seconds of summer. We talked about this. That's right. Yeah. Boy band originally now, killer rock. Group. That's true. And a lot of the times like these people these games these movies can be other things yes. but people don't like to see it you know they're yeah. like oh if you make cuphead make cuphead too we don't want to see like another random game that has nothing to do with it you guys were great at cuphead you know so it was... yeah and i know they got a lot of flack on there um they delayed the game yeah so of course much. yeah um and they actually got oh, this is gonna they got a whole slew of um bullying within their fan base really yeah because it's such an intense and like mastery oh, totally. game toxic that people in itself were toxic around anything that has to do with the game that was posted online i believe it that's um, sad yeah so i i wonder you know i wonder what's going through their heads because yeah i mean maybe they'll just i don't know i don't know here's hoping here's hoping um, that we see a Cuphead 2. That'll be I would love that. podcast down the line. But that is all the time that we have for today. Right, mm-hmm. Ash? Yes, sir. All right. So I've been Nick. And I've been Ash. You've just been Level leveled up. up. Hey, wait. Go get your Switch. What? Why? Death Counter. I think we know what it is. But I right, don't. I'll, I'll get it. I'll play some waiting music. Do-do-do-do-do-do-do. Okay. Now back to your regular <laughs> scheduled programming. So our total death counter uh, on our Switch is 1,154 times. <laughs> and we've been playing for not that long, maybe 10, 10 hours-ish. Yeah. So. Oh, and that is for both of us combined. Yes, yes. We'll have that done. Um. <laughs> All right. Woo!